this lecture on tourism, we'll explore the tourism phenomenon and provide answers to a number of questions. These include, what is tourism? Who is a tourist? What distinguishes an act of tourism from a criminal act? And we'll also explore the def definitions of domestic tourism and international tourism and the factors which distinguishes one from the other. It will highlight some of the difficulties faced by the international community in defining international terrorism, the reasons why a universal definition, a single definition accepted universally has evaded the international community and some of the reasons behind the difficulty in arriving at a consensus. This lecture also explores how national, regional, and international geopolitical realities influence the global response to acts of international terrorism. The most common element in the majority of current definitions of terrorism will be highlighted. Importantly, the definitions of international terrorism and terrorism generally differ from user to user and country to country. And in some cases, the term and definition of terrorism is sometimes abused for political purposes. Let's begin with a question. What is terrorism? First, some examples of the criminal acts often referred to as acts of terrorism, which by themselves do not constitute acts of terrorism, but are merely criminal acts. And here's a caveat. All terrorist acts are criminal, but all violent criminal acts are not acts of terrorism. Later, as we discuss the definition of terrorism, <laughs> you will see why certain criminal acts are characterized as acts of terrorism, and some are not. What are the factors which distinguish and classify them as terrorism? When certain specific factors, other than the violence associated with these criminal acts are present, they are classified as acts of terrorism. We will discuss those other factors later when we look at some of the core elements of the definition of terrorism. As I have indicated, there is a select group of violent criminal acts which are classified as acts of terrorism. These include the following. Hijacking of civilian aircraft blowing up an aircraft, whether it is in flight or on the ground, crashing an aircraft in flight, or otherwise threatening the safety of civilian aircraft and airports, acts affecting or threatening the safety of civil aviation are codified in international law as acts of terrorism. These acts are found in international conventions. There are similar conventions governing the safety of maritime assets, including oil platforms, etc. 
use of bombs to block buildings with the intent to cause harm to civilians or property, setting up explosive devices in public places, such as markets and public gatherings. Much casualties generally result from such actions. Using automatic weapons for mass killing effects, the perpetrators usually expect to die in these attacks. There are other elements to these types of violent crimes, such as motives of a political or ideological nature. Suicide bomb attacks, the terrorist expects to die in the attack. Attacks on diplomats and employees of international organizations and attacks on diplomatic missions and property of international organizations. The use of WMDs against civilian population is also characterized as an act of terrorism. There will be opportunity in a future lecture to explore the 19 international anti-terrorism instruments, conventions and protocols which define a body of international criminal acts characterized as acts of terrorism. These are referred to as anti-terrorism instruments. These anti-terrorism instruments are called ATIs. On September 11, 2001, 9-11, there were 12 ATIs in existence. The 9 11 attacks created an urgency in the international community to address additional terrorist acts not sufficiently covered by the original 12 ATIs. The additional ATIs are also in response to the evolving nature of international terrorism and strengthens international counterterrorism cooperation. International counterterrorism cooperation is critical in efforts to suppress and prevent international terrorism. The evolving nature of terrorism globalization and the growth of the internet and modern forms of communication make it increasingly difficult to distinguish between domestic terrorism and international terrorism. However, there are some very important characteristics which help to distinguish between international terrorism and domestic terrorism, especially for those groups or individuals which stick to a domestic agenda and restrict their activities to the domestic space within which they operate. These include acts against another country's civilians or property property, private or diplomatic, within the perpetrator's own country or in another country. This is where the perpetrator carries out the act in his or her own country of nationality and residence or in another country against civilians or targets of another country other than his or her own. This is also characterized by its cross-border attacks against civilians, property or government of another country, meaning a country different from that of the perpetrator. Violent acts against international organizations, civilians are property of those organizations. 
the criminal acts defined in the international anti-terrorism instruments, the ATIs, which will be discussed in a later lecture. Distinction between international terrorism and domestic terrorism are now not very clearly defined. As stated earlier, due in part to globalization, which facilitate communication with supporters and fundraising activities among sympathizers spread across diaspora communities. Some domestic terrorist groups have used the internet to internationalize their causes, usually fomented by global circumstances. Solely domestic acts, that is, acts which are strictly of a domestic nature and domestic political causes, grievances, and objectives. The acts are against the perpetrators, fellow nationals, own government, or government property within the jurisdiction of the state. Importantly, domestic terrorist acts are within the national borders of the state in which they originate and operate. There is no cross-border element to the act. definition of domestic terrorism in federal law, that is under US federal law, domestic terrorism is defined as activities that involve acts dangerous to human life, that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping and occur primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. This is worth repeating line by line. The definition of terrorism, which is set out in the federal law, the statutes of the United States, and I will go through the four elements, which are the activities that involve acts dangerous to human life, that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state appear to be intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination or kidnapping, and occur primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. It is important to note of the elements of the act which are present in international terrorism, which are missing from the definition of domestic terrorism. What is missing? For an act of domestic terrorism, there is no cross-border activity. <clears throat> no foreign national involved. Also, if in the United States, the actor or actors are American citizens, American nationals against American nationals or residents or against the American government, and the act takes place, on American territory. Now let's turn to the answer, the question, 
who is a terrorist. Generally, a terrorist is an individual who has the intent and capabilities to destroy life and property by violent means for political or ideological reasons. Such political reasons may be real or imagined to coerce a government to act in a particular way contrary to the normal course of things, not necessarily with the objective of overthrowing a government, but to change the way government treats a matter, maybe how the government treats an ethnic or minority group, or to force an occupying government to withdraw its forces from a particular territory. There can be any number of political reasons involved. In some cases, race, ethnicity, extremist ideology, and deliberate misinterpretation of religious doctrine are the rationale behind terrorist activities. The aim of many acts of terrorism is to maximize publicity, which helps in some ways with further recruitment to the ranks of a terrorist group as it seeks to build its notoriety, to interrupt public order, to create chaos in the society, to drive fear in the general population. I repeat, who is a terrorist? Think about these questions. What are the characteristics of a terrorist? How do you identify a terrorist? Does it have to do with one's race or ethnicity? Does it have to do with one's nationality? Does one's religious background make a difference? What about one's socio-economic background? As you try to answer these questions, first dispel any notion that terrorists are restricted to any particular ethnic group, nationality, religion, or socio-economic background. There has been a shift in recent years during which we see an increasing prominent role in the planning and operations of terrorist acts by American-based citizens, both among citizens and permanent residents of the United States. Dozens of American citizens and residents have been charged and convicted of terrorist acts since 9-11. From time to time, we see a number of American citizens traveling abroad, mostly to Pakistan, for training in bomb making and other terrorism crafts. A terrorist could be your next door neighbor, appearing to be an average American. There's great difficulty to profile a terrorist without tracking the individual's movements, travels, and associates. There are numerous examples of American nationals who have been charged and prosecuted and convicted for committing terrorist acts carried out both in the United States as well as abroad against US citizens, allies, and interests. There's often reference to conditions 
conducive to terrorism, including poverty and lack of education. While there are some aspects of such conditions which give rise to recruitment to terrorism, we must be careful, however, as many of the terrorist leaders and recruits are from rich families and are college educated. As we discuss some specific terrorist incidents, you will get to know much more about the background of a number of well-known terrorists and terrorist groups that have no religious affiliation. While on the subject of who is a terrorist, let's take a look at some of what I call faces of terrorism. These faces help to provide a view of actually who is a terrorist in terms of race, ethnicity, and religion. First, let's take a look at the Oklahoma bomber, Timothy James McVeigh. He was a United States Army veteran and security guard who detonated a truck bomb in front of the Alfred P. Mora building in Oklahoma City in 1995, commonly referred to as the Oklahoma City bombing. The attack killed 167 people and injured more than 684. It was the deadliest act of terrorism within the United States prior to the September 11, 2001 attacks, which killed 2,977 people from 90 nations. Of these, 2,753 were killed at the Twin Towers in New York, 184 at the Pentagon, and 40 on Flight 93, which was crashed in the fields at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. On this slide, I'm showing you the face of Osama bin Laden, co-founder and original leader of Al-Qaeda, who was killed by US Navy SEALs on a raid on his compound in Abbottabad in Pakistan on May 2nd, 2011. The operation to kill or capture bin Laden was authorized and ordered by President Barack Obama and was viewed as the most significant counter-terrorism -ter effort against Al-Qaeda. Bin Laden was a native of Saudi Arabia, and he was responsible for leading Al-Qaeda in planning and execution of the 9-11 attacks on the United States. It remains one of the single most deadly terrorist attack in modern history. It changed the global context for combating, preventing, and suppressing terrorism. Ayman al-Zawahiri, an eye surgeon who helped found the Egyptian militant group Islamic Jihad, was named as the new leader of Al-Qaeda on 16 June 2011, a few weeks after bin Laden's death. Al Zawahiri was bin Laden's deputy from the outset of establishing Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. He was among those who planned and executed the 9-11 attacks on the United States. President Joe Biden ordered a drone strike which killed Ayman al-Zawahiri in Afghanistan 
on August 1st, 2022. Muhammad Yusuf, Boko Haram founder and leader, died on July 30, 2009, following his arrest in Nigeria. He died in the custody of Nigeria's security forces. Founded in 2002, Boko Haram remains one of the deadliest terrorist groups today. Boko Haram was responsible for the bombing of the UN building in Abuja, Nigeria on 26th August 2011. At least 23 people were killed and 81 wounded. I spent about two to three weeks in that building in August 2009, while leading a joint UN ECOWAS investigation mission in West Africa. Anders Bering Brevik, a Norwegian shooter, was a 32-year-old Christian fundamentalist. A search of his home and computer found he was inspired by American religious extremist ter literature. Brevik killed eight people with a car bomb in Oslo and gunned down 69 others, most of them teenagers, on Utah Island, Norway, on July 22, 2011. It was the deadliest violence in Norway since World War II. Brevik has been held in isolation since his arrest in 2012. On the left side of this slide, is the underwear bomb. Umar Farouk Abdul Mutalab, a 23-year-old Nigerian, the son of one of Nigeria's most prominent businessmen. Abdul Mutalab had access to international travel and a world-class education. He was described by one of his former British teachers as a dream student, he had attended a college in the United Kingdom. On Christmas Day, 2009, Umar, Umar Farouk, Abdul Mutalab, tried to detonate plastic explosives on a flight from Amsterdam to Detroit. According to American intelligence, he was equipped by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, ACAB, a Yemeni group, and he was instructed by Anwar al-Alaki. No. On the right is American Yemeni cleric, Anwar, Anwar al-Alaki. He was the head of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, based in Yemen. Born and schooled in the United States, Al-Alaki was often referred to as the American Cherry. By 2010, American intelligence described Al-Alaki as the Bin Laden of the Internet and the most dangerous man in the world. His command of English a knowledge of American culture made him a valuable asset in the Al-Qaeda worldwide organization. Al-Alaki was marked for death. He was killed by a U.S. airstrike in Yemen on September 30, 2011. Jared Laughlin, 22 years old, carried out an assassination attempt on Congresswoman Gabrielle Gifford 
on January 2011 at a Congress on your corner event outside of Tucson, Arizona. Gifford was shot in the head. She survived, but suffered certain paralysis. Six people were killed and 12 more injured. Now that you have seen a sampling of the faces of terrorism, which depicts different ethnicity and races, as well as different nationalities and religion, has it altered your perspectives as to who is a terrorist? Conclusion, being a terrorist has nothing to do with ethnicity, national, nationality, religion, or socioeconomic background. Faces of terrorism also highlighted the role played by motivation and ideology in determining who is a terrorist. There is no simple answer to the question, who is a terrorist? A universal agreement on the definition of terrorism is even more difficult than determining who is a terrorist. While the international community has formed a level of consensus on the core elements of terrorism, on the factors which constitute a terrorist act, there is no agreement on a universally accepted definition of terrorism. Each country defines terrorism according to its own experiences and according to its national security interests and political objectives. Here in the United States, there are several variants of the definitions of terrorism. There are variants based on legislation enacted in the U.S. Congress to fit the purpose and objective of the legislation. The differences in definition tend to follow the specific mandates and perspectives of the different agencies and departments of the U.S government. However, all definitions contain certain core elements. I won't spend a lot of time going through the details of the different definitions of terrorism used by the different U.S. government agencies. Instead, I will discuss the elements that are most recognized in what passes for the definition of terrorism here in the United States and in most countries around the world. Please pay particular attention to the definition of international terrorism. Pay full attention to what is on the slide on your screen, and to what I add during this lecture. This definition you'll find quite useful over and over again. An acceptable or common definition of terrorism is important, particularly agreement on certain common elements in the criminal codes of countries around the world. This is particularly important when the United States government seeks counterterrorism cooperation and the assistance of other countries in investigating, apprehending, extraditing, and prosecuting terrorists from foreign lands. 
what are these four elements? Let's go through them one by one. As I mentioned, it is important that countries around the world adopt these four elements. <coughs> The U.S. and the cooperating countries must have commonality of definition for effective mutual legal assistance and for extradition purposes. Globally, the word terrorism is politically and emotionally charged. Depending on different experiences in different countries, the difficulties in arriving at a common definition accepted to all countries around the world is compounded by national and regional history and politics. These factors determine for each country what is terrorism and who is a terrorist. In defining international terrorism, we can look at some of the most common elements or objectives of a terrorist act. So what are they? Wantonly kill civilians without regard for innocence, women and children. The more people that are killed, mass casualties in an act of terrorism is the more notorious a terrorist or terrorist group becomes. Two, a common purpose is to instill fear in the general population. That is to provoke a state of terror so that pressure is brought to bear on governments to react in a certain way or to coerce the population to support the terrorist objectives. Mass terror demonstrates the potential recruits that the terrorist group carrying out the act has legitimacy as a group sharing common ideology or political objectives in engaging the acts of terrorism. It helps in recruitment to the terrorist group from among political and religious sympathizers. Three, another purpose is to coerce a government or international organization to take certain action or to refrain from taking certain action. For example, the main purpose of Al-Qaeda that is often cited for the United States to remove its troops from Arab lands. Hence the Khobar Towers bombing in Saudi Arabia on June 25, 1996, which killed 19 U.S. Air Force service members. It was intended to drive the U.S. military out of Saudi Arabia. Bear in mind, the U.S. military was in Saudi Arabia at the Saudi government's invitation. The U.S. military services were invited to establish a base in Saudi Arabia to remove Iraq from occupation of Kuwait during the first Gulf War. U.S. military service members lived in the coast Towers. According to Al Qaeda documents found in the home of Osama bin Laden, where he was killed, the strategic calculation of the terrorist group was that the 9 11 attacks on the United States would force the US to withdraw from all Arab lands. This was a miscalculation. Instead, the U.S. government under President George W. Bush launched the war on terrorism. The war on terrorism included 
the invasion of Afghanistan on October 2001, and the eventual killing of Al Qaeda leadership and decimating the terrorist training camps in Pakistan and practically destroying Al Qaeda. That is the core Al Qaeda. We will discuss Al Qaeda further in future lectures. A fourth core element. The act of terrorism is characterized as international terrorism when the perpetrator is of a different nationality from the victim, individual, country, or entity. Fifth element, the act takes place in another country. It's cross-border. Sixth element, international terrorism includes any act which takes place against an international organization for the purposes set out above and is characterized as an act of terrorism regardless of where the act takes place. Such acts are normally defined in international conventions, which we will discuss later. Number seven, certain criminal acts which constitute offenses within the scope of and is defined in the international conventions and protocols relating to terrorism, the anti-terrorism instruments. ATIs will be discussed in more details later. I repeat, it's important to keep the preceding elements of international terrorism in mind to separate the discussion of international terrorism from discussion of domestic terrorism. References to international terrorism will be in keeping with the four elements found in the definition. The response to one is different from the response to the other. Although certain law enforcement assets may deal with both. I've so far explained what is terrorism, who is a terrorist, and the definitions of international and domestic terrorism. Now, let's turn to the response to international terrorism. I will begin with the international response to international terrorism, and in particular, the response of the United Nations system. The three principal organs of the United Nations for purposes of the study of terrorism are the United Nations Secretariat, the United Nations General Assembly, and the United Nations Security Council. The UN Secretariat, led by the UN Secretary General, is the executive arm of the United Nations. Former Secretary General Kofi Annan, in his April 2006 report, Uniting Against Terrorism, detailed his proposal for a UN counterterrorism strategy. Annan also established the Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force within the UN Secretariat, bringing together representatives of 20 plus UN entities whose work potentially contributed to counterterrorism capacity building and empowerment, including the US Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, Terrorism Prevention Branch, the UN Development Program, UNDP, and a host of other UN bodies and agencies. <laughs> 
totaling 22 such UN bodies. The UN has since established the UN Counterterrorism Center with a central role within the UN system for countering terrorism around the world. The United Nations General Assembly generally is, is comprised of 193 members of sovereign states. It is a political body which makes policies to guide the UN member states. The UN General Assembly has adopted a number of resolutions condemning terrorism. The first was adopted in 1974. And in 1994, it adopted its declaration on terrorism. But let's back up for a moment. Its first resolution in 1974 was called Measures to Eliminate International Terrorism. I had the opportunity to participate in the drafting and consideration of the counterterrorism resolution that was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1976. The UN General Assembly followed with the 1995 Declaration Against Terrorism, which went even further. The 1995 Declaration strongly rejected any rationale whatsoever for acts of terrorism. It states as follows. Criminal acts intended or calculated to provoke a state of terror in the general public, a group of persons or particular persons for political purposes are in any circumstances unjustifiable, whatever the considerations of a political, philosophical, ideological, racial, ethnic, religious, or any other nature that may be invoked to justify them. One of the most important phrase within this declaration, and please note, the unequivocal rejection of what was considered to be the political exception in any circumstances. Prior to this declaration by the UN General Assembly, several states used what they call the political justification, the political exception to justify certain acts of terrorism under certain political Let me give you two examples. They did not consider violent acts against an occupying force as terrorism, such as Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory. Neither would any act of violence against an oppressive government be considered acts of terrorism, such as was the case with South Africa apartheid. Certain counter-terrorism conventions included some form of political exception such as the Organization of African Unity Counterterrorism Convention, now the African Union Convention, and the Organization of the Islamic Conference Convention on Combating International Terrorism. The UN General Assembly established the Ad Hoc Committee on Terrorism in 1972 to receive reports 
and develop recommendations to combat terrorism. The UN General Assembly Global Counterterrorism Strategy was adopted on September 6, 2006, as a result of the recommendations made by Secretary General Kofi Annan in his report, Uniting Terrorism. More on the UN Global City Strategy and other UN General Assembly actions will be presented in future lectures. The third major body, the United Nations Security Council, comprised of 15 UN member states, five permanent and 10 elected to serve two-year terms, establishes counter-terrorism mandates and obligations applicable to all UN member states. It's important to know the UN Security Council is the only international body empowered to create mandates and obligations for the 119 sovereign member states of the United Nations. The UN Security Council has adopted several resolutions establishing counterterrorism mandates, which are adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter making their implementation mandatory on all 193 members of the United Nations. While serving on the Security Council in 2001, I participated in the drafting discussions of Resolution 1373, which was adopted on 28 September 2001 indirect response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States. Resolution 1373 was unprecedented in the scope of the mandates it created for all UN member states. Any study on terrorism and the global response would be with incomplete without studying the impact of Resolution 1373 on counterterrorism capacity building and international counterterrorism cooperation. The UN Security Council adopted several other counterterrorism resolutions, both pre and post 9-11 which are important to the study of terrorism. We will have an opportunity to discuss these in further detail. The Security Council also created mechanisms to monitor implementation by all states of its counterterrorism mandates and to facilitate counterterrorism capacity building in states which needed help. These mechanisms include the Counterterrorism Committee, CTC, and the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate, CTED, to monitor and facilitate the mandates of Resolution 1373. I served as an expert advisor to the CTC for just over three years, where I was responsible for developing and facilitating a program of counterterrorism capacity building globally in keeping with the mandate of Resolution 1373 and subsequent resolutions, such as, such as Resolution 1377. There's also the 1267 committee, the monitoring team that works at that committee, which was established to monitor implementation of security council mandates against Al-Qaeda, 
Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, and that resolution was adopted on 15 October 1999. There's a 1540 committee and an expert group on terrorism to monitor implementation of resolution 1540 to ensure that weapons of mass destruction, in particular, nuclear weapons, were not available and could not be acquired by terrorist groups. And there's also the 1566 Working Group on Terrorism with a mandate to develop and recommend new measures to combat terrorism. And that was adopted on October 8, 2004. We will be discussing these resolutions and the counter-terrorism mechanisms in more detail later.